ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome my guests, Laura Gravel and Tatiana Grossu. And uh, we're going to be doing one of our wonderful Poets of the East shows. Chances are my brother, Mersha Danduta, will be here with us uh, to bring his insight and his literary flair to our adventures. Uh, first, let me ask you, Laura. Laura, when did you really get captured by the writing bug? Uh, did you like poetry and, and reading as a child? Uh, talk about your youth. Um, yes, the writing bug really hit me when I was 17. I had always loved to read everything, fiction, nonfiction, uh, poems, Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, Child's Garden of Verse, I believe it's called. Uh, and yes, I loved to read. I loved nature. My parents um, were both visual artists. <clears throat> so the artist's lifestyle I knew was difficult. <laughs> and, Welcome, uh, Marcia. Go ahead, Laura. Yes. So I grew up in Austin, Texas, which was a, a fortunate place to grow up near the University of Texas, very near, and uh, lots of parks, creeks. Uh, so I loved the word, you know, if you want to say the written word. And my parents, they were a painter and a sculptor. Oh. And uh, so we had a lot of, you know, in our family, friends, visual artists. Uh, a few writers too, and I think I was a little bit afraid, but then when I was 17, I was in my first university class, a first person essay, um, and the professor said, oh, you know, this is great, and I really enjoyed it, and that's how it started, and I, I did, I tried journalism some, uh, I wrote essays, short stories, poems, and Journalism, just daily journalism wasn't for me. That made me too nervous. <laughs> I loved I loved the people. I loved working at the student newspaper at UT, which was a very good student newspaper. I loved that, but I wanted to write quietly in the corner and not have people shouting and running around and, you know, editors and we have a deadline now. I did do copy editing. That was a lot of, that was fun just to be part of the picture. And I took some classes, uh, but yes, I, I also was writing poetry. And the problem was, I think, or it wasn't a problem, but the university or the universities then seemed to really push writing short stories and eventually novels. And I don't know if this was a you know U.S. wide phenomena or it probably was fairly much at the university academic level. So then I went more into the short story direction. Um, and yes, I, I went on doing that for a number of years. And, you know, I, I did get into spoken word in, in the 90s, the early 90s, which I think was some of the earlier times of it. And I was writing these pieces that were um, partly, you know, performed and I did it to a friend or two because Austin is full of musicians. <laughs> and I, I said, oh, look at this. Uh, and my friend who was a singer songwriter said, you have to do that in front of people. And I said, oh no, no, no. You know, I was always really shy. And uh, she said, yes, yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, you probably don't think I'm shy at this point, Rick, having seen me on international Zooms, but at the time I was, but I went out there and started doing this stuff, uh, some rather outrageous pieces. There was a tomato, a to tomato, tomato, tomato piece. And there was Joan of Texarkana, which was about uh, ending racial strife <laughs> in, in the deep South. And- That's uh, the depiction then. Yes, yes, it was. <laughs> and the killer bees, the killer bees were in that one too. Wow. <laughs> It was I'm going to stop you for a second. I want to ask yes. a question. Um, I, I'm wondering, you know, to say short stories covers a lot of ground. Um, yes. Are we talking, uh, should we say, kind of vignettes, a picturesque uh, 
stories? Are we talking about humorous work or sci-fi, sci social commentary? What kind of short stories were you writing then in college? I was very taken by writers like Flannery O'Connor, William okay. Faulkner, and I began to be very interested in Latin American uh, magical realism, Russian, mm -hmm. Uh, and surrealism. I, I was studying Spanish for the first <clears throat> three years of university. I liked, um, and I've written words down in case I can't remember them. <laughs> um, Borges. Yes, Jorge Luis oh, Borges. Yeah. I liked him. I liked uh, Marquez, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and one of my favorite Russian writers, Mikhail Bulgakov. Sorry, my pronunciation is not as good in that area. Oh, but, that's okay. Um, Master and Margarita, but so my my stories tended to be sort of having some of the Southern Gothic mixed with surreal because I don't know that the you know Faulkner and these people were really uh, surreal. Although you know it depends, <laughs> but but yeah. So that that was you know as I told a relative once who said why don't you write about us? I said but I write about weird people. I'm afraid I said it the wrong way. I said you're too boring. <laughs> <laughs> or not quite like that, but you know, I wrote about strange things, and so, or tried, you know, and and that's uh, the different things I saw in life or interesting characters. So that's that's what I was interested in. Uh, the '60s and '70s were some really, uh, I'm I'm going to call them revolutionary times. A lot of social upheaval, and certainly mm -hmm. Texas with Austin being that one little spot of sanity in a vast yeah. desert of, um, let's be genteel, uh, backward looking <laughs> social yeah. perception. Uh, I, I, have, I have a daughter in Austin, uh. or about that some other time. Um, yeah, so all right, now you got into performance, you were sort of nudged into performance, uh, I'm sure that the energy uh, when you were presenting is it certainly captured your uh, your focus and intention. True. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. I got uh, there was a it was the first years of the Hyde Park Frontera Fest, which was a you know sort of edge festival and of shorts. I think they were about fifteen minutes long, fifteen or twenty minutes, and so that's when I did Joan of Texarkana, and I got the first time a best of week uh, award, you know, wow. and then I did it, I did it for the whole week. The, the unfortunate thing, and you start to learn with performance is <clears throat> that it always depends on so many things. So when I went back for the best of week, I had a little audio they were supposed to play. Well, they played it, but they hadn't charged the machine. So oh, it, played no. at, it played at this prehistoric speed. <laughs> and I thought, you know, there I was standing on stage, and I thought, what the, you know, what is that? I didn't even recognize because oh, it was wow. sort of a theme song to like Bonanza or one of those things, <laughs> da, 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 you know. And uh, <laughs> so I, I went up and I did the piece. I just started doing it, and later a friend said, "Well, you really wouldn't know um, if if you didn't know what the first you know, the, what it really was supposed to sound like, but it was this really slow sound instead of sort of a, you know, giddy up. And that was a surreal piece being Joan of Texarkana, but, um, you know, which was like Joan of Arc and, and she's right. burned at the stake at the end of the piece. <laughs> but- uh, well, That couldn't happen in Texas. Yeah, well, no. And uh, well, you know, this is the gateway to Arkansas. It's a hot area up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, it just didn't have the energy that without that, you know, if the music hadn't been there at all, I could have done better. And they never said, which would have been nice, apologize, oh, you know, the music really wasn't right or anything. So, yeah, you, you start to learn also the crowd, you know, if there's one guy on the front row who laughs all the time, and even before you start to speak, <laughs> versus, you know, not having that guy there and everybody looking like they just just had, uh, you know, some sort of torture to them. But yeah, it, it was it was quite interesting because I had been too afraid in my younger years to do drama, you know, at high school where those people seemed to be having a lot of fun, but I was, you know, 
too afraid. And yeah, no, I, I learned a lot over that time. Um, I mean, I, I went on really from there, I moved to Europe and started living in places where no one understood what I said. <laughs> and so that was a problem. Uh, well, I lived in the country in the US, then in Europe, um, because I could also not participate in a literary level. I mean, here we have Mircea, who's incredible, um, and Tatiana, who can just sit here. And I became also deafer at, through the years. And uh, it seems to be partly genetic and partly due to loud music early, because there was a lot of that in Austin. Sure. But, but so what happened was I started writing novels, which I barely sent out, uh, but I wrote, well, I guess, you know, in total three full two parts or something. So over the years of being in seclusion and places where the language was a difficulty and I had to, you know, adjust to different languages, different cultures and get the children in school and help them survive sanely. Um, yeah, I just wrote the longer things and short stories and essays. And then it was when uh, I came, to the UK and was here for a number of years that I got in accidentally into poetry and then at a spoken word event, <laughs> which was strange. Um, and they said, oh, that was great. You should do that some more, you know? So I, I, I got back into that in 2018, but it, yeah, it had been a big break from the tomato and Joan of Texarkana. And I can't remember, there were some other pieces I did uh, <clears throat> which I have, Joan of, oh no, I have a different piece on my YouTube. Unfortunately, Joan of Texarkana was never filmed uh, close up. So unfortunately, but but uh, the tomato piece is a little bit X-rated. And so my friends who begged me to put on, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> but I, I have to tell you a funny story real briefly uh, about the other side of that technology problem that you had with your slow tape. Um, I was a technical producer for a concert company for about 10 years. And uh, long story short, uh, they said they were going to close the production department. And they said, you can just leave today. And I said, no, no, I've, I've committed to the local ballet company that I was going to produce their final performance. And that would, that would be my last show. And I said, so I'm, I'm going to do that. They said, no, you don't have to. I said, no, no, no. I'm going to do it. I gave them my word. I'm going to tech produce it. So as we're on our way to this concert and performance, uh, it was going to be in the middle of downtown at this huge office building. It was a big park there. Literally every afternoon during lunchtime, there were probably five, 600 people milling around this park space. And it's in Miami. And uh, I was talking to my crew and I said, you know what? I just had this feeling. I'm going to go the extra mile. We had a boom box that we used to plug into and it would feed into the sound system because of course the ballet is performing to orchestral music. Well, my guy said, well, what's the problem? I said, well, just in case, I wanna go buy batteries on our way to the show. And they go, oh, Rick, Rick, come on, look, we went, we tested it, everything's fine. There's power there, it's not a problem. I said, you know, I'm gonna stop and buy batteries because by God, my last show, I wanted flawless. I don't want any chance of there being a problem. So, okay, so we stopped with batteries. And now there's the ballet companies there. They're at the ready. They've got their costumes. We have the stage. There's probably six, 700 people there. I'm just so thrilled. We press, we're ready to go. I'm ready to do the announcements. And we completely lose power. The absolute power goes away. And my crew goes, oh, my God, what are we going to do? I said, not a problem. Unplug the tape machine from our sound system. It's a big boom box. And inside this cavernous patio area between two big glass buildings, it'll be fine. So we press play. I introduce them. I, I have a loud voice. So I introduce them. The, the ballet goes on flawlessly. The music's playing. But then the next interesting thing happened. People kept coming out of the buildings. Because, of course, there's no power, so there's no sense them sitting around in their buildings. So we had this massive audience, right? <laughs> well, I'm busy producing the show. Finally, it's over. 
everybody's pleased. The ballet company never expected that kind of audience. The audience was probably 3,000 people by the time. And <laughs> when we left, we found out that just at the moment of our downbeat, the electric company that supplies all of South Florida from Key West to Orlando lost power. So even though the half of the state of Florida had no power, my show went on perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very positive memory, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Rick, this reminds me, it's, it's a very short story, I, I, I promise, it's uh, very short. Um, you know, about uh, having music or not having music uh, to a certain text or to a certain passage within a, a musical or non-musical part. You know, they say there were two bassists, they were retired and they meet after, and one of them says, how do you spend your time? Well, I'm going to the opera. Come on, man, are you fed up with opera after all your life in opera? He says, no, man, now I'm going there as a spectator, as a viewer, it's completely different. Come on, what could be different? Listen, man, do you remember this part when we have it? Vum, 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 vum. Yes, of course. Do you know how does it hear from the, from the, from the hall, from the room? Come on, how? Tore adorum data. Very nice. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. So, Laura, you pretty much stayed away from performance because you had family things to do in Europe. And it wasn't until COVID, do I understand? That's when you really started doing spoken word again? Yes, I, I did do a few pieces. Um, I, I'm not keeping it a secret. I moved from Texas to, let me try to remember, Austria. And there, most people in that little area spoke Mühlfittlerisch. So, you know, uh, there was not just one language, Mühlfittlerisch and German to learn. And then we moved to Italy later and then we moved to Geneva where people speak French so and lots of other languages but French is the uh, lingua franca of the city and then we moved to Britain so you know I would have to try to learn the language whenever we moved somewhere else and so the, the one language I'd studied Spanish <laughs> besides English was not in those places except sometimes <laughs> you'd hear it on the street and I'd be like oh Oh, he just spoke Spanish, you know, and I would start to cry <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, in Texas, that's that's a lingua. But yeah, so I did do a few pieces. I had a friend who was American who was a singer in Austria, and we had a night. At one point, my husband said, you're depressed. You need to have something. And we had this school where they would have events. And so she sang in between me doing pieces. And oh, then, and actually, I was invited soon after we moved to Austria to do some sort of reading at my husband's cousin's in Stuttgart or near there. And I wrote one of the pieces that is still one of my most popular. You may have seen it, Rick. It's Turning 40 at a Tupperware Party. Yes. And yes. Uh, so people piece. still still love that. <laughs> and I mean, I've I've, you know, refined it just a little bit, but really it was. You can see that at that point I still had humor <laughs> before before well, I went all through the rest of Europe. But but people really liked that. That I had a you know slightly more German words in that version, although the the crowd was a very educated crowd and spoke a good bit of English. Uh, but you know, so I did that there, and I did the other one at the school, and then in Geneva later I did a couple of readings, and even sold CDs or whatever you call them of one of my novels that was set in Austria. So yeah, and, and um, I, you know, I found enough people, invited a bunch of uh, women I'd met who spoke or understood English. Geneva, you know, everybody speaks about three languages. <laughs> right, right. And, and so, yeah, I did do a little bit here and there, yeah. Okay, so COVID takes off. Suddenly there is this new community of international poets. Goodness, thank you. They're all speaking English, many of them. <laughs> Because unfortunately, I am mostly monolingual. Um, 
you've had some wonderful experiences. You've been recognized. You know, your work has been very, very well received. I've seen you appear in so many places. Um, would you like to read a couple of your recent pieces? Yes, certainly. I'm going to actually read a very short one to start with that. Hey, absolutely. Starting from, starting from the COVID time. I mean, I had been performing live before that, but uh, this one is just very short. And this is about COVID. So we can sort of enter there. It's called You Doing Okay. I could have eaten grapevine leaves, but chocolate is what came to me. In these times of mask it or mess it, I've got a little confused, bless it. It's probably better not to go back to bed, though I already did that, it has to be said. Let's go out, look for ladybugs. What do you say? We'll follow one from leaf to blade. Ask her how she keeps from flying astray. Ask her how she gets her day underway. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> Cheerful and short to start. Sure. Okay, so can, do I go on to something else? You, or, you can or? take your time, have fun. In fact, I would say, please, Think of it like this, uh, you know, when we're doing these typical Zooms, you have three or four minutes, do the long piece. Do the one that you wanted to yeah. read aloud. Don't worry okay. about it. Stretch out, my dear. Okay. I'm going to do this one, which I actually, I don't think I've ever done on a Zoom because I'd forgotten about a it. A first. It's, yeah. <laughs> Except that I did it once, at least in Nottingham before COVID. It's called On Hugging Terms. Are we on hugging terms? A newer friend asks. Well, I think so, I say, hesitating. What I don't say, but what I mean is, since I left Austin, Texas, where I grew up in a central neighborhood near a certain park encircled by a creek, a park that held the magic of Eeyore's birthday party each May with maypoles and egg races and a real donkey and the happiness of people playing frisbee with dogs every day. Dogs wearing bandanas and called booby and dooby and such. And where I grew up in that city whose motto is keep Austin weird and is the home of the film Slacker and of Misfits and Rock and Roll and Willie Nelson and Grey Ghost and Antone's Blue Club, Blues Club and Omar and the Howlers and Hippies and blasting loud music in general. And where lived my not hippie parents and my childhood friends who grew up and marched in the January 2017 Women's March in spite of a certain president and four human rights which marching let me know those friends were who I thought they were. And where in that certain part called Eastwood, as a child, I spent long summer days passionately playing and sweating under towering pecan trees and enduring live oaks and purple blooming crepe myrtles and wild mustang grapevines. And where once in a warm summer rain, suddenly thousands of termites crawled out of the softball field soil and rose up in a great brown cloud and flew off. And where were the schools that taught and tortured me, the children that played with me or refused, the best friends, the crushes I had, the university I loved, the geography I kissed, and the paths I charted on feet and bike and car, crisscrossing hearts and concrete. And where so many citizens felt they had to drive huge cars everywhere they went, even those members of the environmentalist Sierra Club. 
and where a friend named Glenn Allen once grew a 25 foot high tomato plant and the newspaper published a picture of him on a ladder next to that high rise plant and where were a horde of rock musicians and indie film people and hipsters and artists and where everyone is in a band, including Glenn, of course. And where we voted into office hippie and gay and female and black and Hispanic politicians and a Jewish woman turned Quaker named Margaret Hofmann, who left Germany after the war and became an activist, chaining herself to trees. But where also exists some of the dumbest politicians in the world, including one governor, Bill Clements, who always pronounced nuclear, nuclear. And where a once in a thousand years, funny as all get out journalist named Molly Ivins gave them all H-E-L-L, -L, including a more recent politician and president she nicknamed Shrub a.k.a. George W. Bush. And where in that certain park, in the ripple curve of the creek there below, you could forget the cars and the interstate and hear the frogs and cicadas sing of freedom in the quiet, black-starred, clear-sky nights. And be proud of the radiating heat of summer streets and the burning days that had to be chopped to walk through, and the icy streets of a blue norther that tore through that legendary single strand of barbed wire between us and Canada in just a couple of hours, plummeting us all to skidding cars and shivering under blankets. And where I was born in the old Seton Hospital run by Catholic sisters, and did I say I was churched at St. Austin's by Paulist fathers who never bothered me, were kind, in fact. And, well, what I mean here is, if we're on hugging terms, you should understand. Since I left Austin, Texas, I have been terrified very nice very nice very nice thank I you i have some um, fond memories of austin myself <laughs> and obviously this was from a time in the 60s 70s and 80s mostly you know um uh, it did change a lot with money <laughs> yeah most most things do um, so now I have a shorter piece that is really, I wrote, um, it's called Girl Walking Across Europe. And uh, I didn't really mean it just me, uh, because all these refugees and the times we live in, but I, I, I put it together and this is done on my YouTube channel as a single performance with me. And then a group I worked with, a bunch of wonderful poets in the East Midlands of the UK helped, and we did this as a collaborative effort, which is a lovely um, piece that is for its, our group was called Poets for Refugees. So here it is. Girl Walking Across Europe. Let's watch a girl walk across Europe. Walk across Europe with a backpack and a cat named Hermani Wab. And as she walks, people join her, not to tell her to go home, not to warn her off the borders, but to give her flowers and biscotti and an embroidered cloak and to walk beside her across the boot of Italy, where the sea captain did not get arrested for saving her from the sinking boat, but was lauded and crowned with roses. Where the embroidered girl walks on 
with Hermaniwab to arrive at the Austrian border, where she is not sent to a refugee camp, but where the chancellor greets and gifts her with a handsome horse-drawn carriage, where she rides and parades with a brass band through a Vienna that throws her kisses. Where at the city's edge, she gets out and asks to walk on, calling Hermaniwab to her side, walking along the Danube with blue in her hair and honey on her lips, where she waltzes on, copper skin shining, singing an ancient chant. Very nice, very nice, very nice. Shall I go on to another one? Or... Please, please. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll do Blue Hair Touching God. <laughs> Shows some okay. of my surrealism. Surrealism. Uh, so, Blue Hair Touching God. When my husband stands, blue hair touching God aims the whalebone straight through me, then lifts his hands. I recognize their movement from long ago, from back somewhere before I was born. Some sort of sign it was from when the swirling code was just a greeting. His swaying body confuses. I feel for his pulse. Stay, stick out your tongue. Down that red gangplank march the migrants of the world. Our own family, early man Africans, bearing straight crossers, colonizing Europeans, former colonies peoples, today's Latin Americans, war-torn Balkans, Armenians, Syrians, Holocaust fleers, fighting persecutors, giving birth, headless deformed, crying, bleeding. His pulse grows weak. No, I shout. Go back inside, he will protect you. But I know they must come. And God waits, small, at the end of their trail. Size isn't everything. Not to mention, we can't see a thing out here. Bravo, bravo, very Thank good. You. you wanna do one more, Laura? Um, yes, let me just see where that we are here. Um, does it, should it be short, long, medium? Medium. <laughs> medium, okay. I'm gonna I'm give you a I'm feeling psychic, go medium. <laughs> I'm gonna go Scrimshaw then, you heard that last night at another event, Scrimshaw. Start here, carve the house on my lowest rib, a floater not attached to sternum or future. Then rib by rib etch a father, a mother, and three kids. Show the detail. My father had a beard and a gift for story. My mother had freckles and a steady job. 
my sister was quiet and grew quieter. Show the grandparents who wanted to help. Shipped hulls filled with gifts, posted kisses and sighs. Show how the nuclear family sit facing away from each other, all five. Show the war that, oh no, this is about me. Start again here at the base of my spine, a bone called the sacrum, a place for the sacred that connects me to ambulatory motion towards a point not yet known to the stars. Incise the scene. Show how the whale breached, how I leaped into his mouth, then traveled the ocean eating marrow and gristle. How the whale beached, but I found new people who spoke new tongues with different teeth. By day, I cooked potatoes and wore a kerchief. Told people I was Czech, though they knew I was touched. Late at night, hidden in the toilet, with the compassion and ink of blueberry schnapps, I pushed the pain down into my left tibia, where I scratched the mutiny, the seasons, the sea battle, in the indigo wars that never happened. Bravo, bravo. Thank you. Laura, let me ask you one more question, if I may, dear. You know, poetry, although we know it as a powerful force, uh, a crucial, vital part of literature, the world doesn't quite understand. The world looks away. The world tends to think it too often is just a frivolous thing. Um, if a young person came to you and said, you know, I'm, I would like to be a poet. I'd like to do that. Is it worth it? Do, is it important? What would you say? I would say it's very important. Poets are prophets. And I think you have to have the long view because actually I, I went to graduate school at a different university and there again, poets were sort of, there were a lot of them, um, but they weren't, it wasn't considered a serious way forward, you know. Um, you're not going to earn a living. Of course, you can try to be a poetry professor somewhere, but, but um, you know, you have Khalil Gibran, one of my favorite poets. He's a prophet and, and many poets are prophets. William Blake, um, I mean, there's, there's so many amazing poets. Uh, I had this huge list in case you asked me because I can't remember names, you know, and I thought oh, it would be terrible if I forgot everyone's name. <laughs> but I think what I would say, because, even then, I didn't really necessarily, as a younger person in my 20s and early 30s, think that I would make a living out of poetry or out of fiction, excuse me. However, my parents were visual artists and I saw them, you know, my mother really made a living as a librarian, um, which was wonderful. But yes, I would say you have to have the long view. You know, you have to have the long view. Is this something you want to give to the humanity? And don't necessarily set yourself up, oh, I'm going to make a lot of money or I'm going to be a poetry professor, which is a, definitely a more attainable uh, role, but you can only have so many of those. <laughs> um, so I got yes, into I, poetry for the money myself. <laughs> I, yes, yes. I, I was really never a believer in big money in the, in the writing industry. But, but uh, yeah, so I, that's what I would say. I would say you're going to have to have the long view you're going to have to be, uh, you know, what poets are, philosopher poets, and and um, go at it like that and enjoy it. And you will just, I mean, just like with, with Zoom and this new international connection thing we have here, which is incredible, um, you will have a following. And, and poetry has taken off. I mean, poetry books have sold better in the U.S. in recent decades. 
people want to read, including young people, shorter things. We are at this point where, you know, a lot of people, they don't have the attention span or whatever, the time uh, to put into it. They're not You're sitting around. Woman. Yes, they're not, they're not reading Moby Dick, which I liked. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I, that's what I would say is, is if you really like it, don't give up. And it, it can be something that comes and goes in your life and um, comes again. And that's okay. You know, that's okay. That's what I would say. Thank you so very much. Um, when you get a chance, uh, send me a, a link to your YouTube site or web page or whatever, and I'll include that in the promotional material. Thank you so much, Laura. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. It was lots of fun. Okay, good. Uh, if you're welcome to stay if you'd like, but we're going to now do our uh, interview with Tatiana. I'm sure Mercia will be back in a moment. Tatiana, welcome. Hello. How are you today? Oh, there we go. Mercia's back. I'm going to put you into the gentle hands of my good brother, Mercia Danduta, who knows much more about you than I do. Mercia, sir, okay. take it away. Thank you very much, sir. I am really privileged and uh, sincerely, it is a very sensitive metaphor, the one you uh, created uh, just now. And uh, I'm still under the uh, I'm still under the imperium of uh, uh, an empire of uh, of it. I I hope I will because I'm flushing all around. So I have been flushing all around, and uh, I hope I will be man I will manage to uh, to continue telling a couple of things about this uh, wonderful poet, the young poet Tatiana Grosso. Uh, and uh, if but before this, if Tatiana allows me. And uh, of course, in the same time, if uh, Laura and you as a producer and a main host of the program allow me as well, I would like to mention at least two things I think I consider very important about Laura Gravel as a poet and uh, as, uh, um, as in spite of uh, what she mentioned being timid and shy, as a performer. Uh, before, I, of course, I was knowing her creation. I was knowing her works uh, before uh, before this program, but it was something different. I watched her uh, during a couple of programs, uh, and uh, I wrote and I read. I read some of her poems, some of her of her collections, but it is something else when the author herself is. Uh, is uh, reciting uh, her own work. And there is a very important aspect uh, I want to stress, her engagement. Her engagement as, uh, uh, as uh, a poetess, which is preoccupied by the moral problems, by the big moral problems, uh, which are uh, important in the main, in, the, in this moment uh, in the world. Uh, they become much more authentic, much more credible, and her poetry becomes much more involved, and if you want, much more uh, fluid with this thematics when being recited by the author, uh, by the author uh, herself. Even things which are actually, uh, usually are uh, declamations, we are used to so you are used to listen on media or on television when being recited, when being parts of Laura Gravel's poetry, they become profound, complex, and original metaphors. And this is not available for everyone. I want to congratulate Laura for this because this is making one of her main uh, and strongest dimensions uh, as a poet, uh, as an author. And the second thing, is the traveling the, the traveling dimension the traveling dimension is to be seen is to be observed i would say during the same verse during the during each verse of her poet of her poems um, so it is i think it is very important that she confessed about traveling throughout the whole europe as 
she mentioned, because this explains a lot uh, about her poetry. This explains this explains um, in a big measure her engagement, her um, her um, uh, moral uh, engagement, and her uh, the causes she's uh, uh, sustaining the the causes she's uh, she's fighting for, and uh, in the same time. Uh, uh, if you want, it closes the circle. I mean, the the horizontal circle. It was the one of the metaphors I was trying to uh, talk bef about before. The vertical circle. It was the one with the uh, travel, with the traveling and the moral dimension. Two circles perpendicularly on it make a sphere. Laura, your poetry, your creation is a sphere. It has, it is, uh, it it is equally distant towards the center, and this means something. Uh, this means something towards perfection. It is not perfect because nothing is perfect, of course, but it tends to the sphere. And I admire you for all of this. Congratulations. Okay, uh, I hope I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't so. Uh, I, so I, I didn't talk so long as. Uh, I used to. I'm get, I'm getting back to the uh, to uh, our to uh, to my guest uh, Tatiana, and uh, I am very happy to welcome her here. And I think uh, it is a chance, an opportunity for her to be here at Poets of the East. And in the same time, I think it is opportunity, an opportunity for Poets of the East to have as a guest one of the most uh, admired and uh, one of the most recognized. Uh, young poetesses in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, a name which is already uh, already known uh, among this uh, part, uh, this part of the world, already translated into different uh, into different languages, and one on one hand, uh, equally engaged in moral dimensions of uh, the world we are living in, like Laura. In the same time. Um, sensitive, original in metaphors, and with an incredible metaphorical disponibility, uh, which uh, uh, which I think um, I, I saw being equaled only uh, by a Hungarian poetess I used to admire very much, uh, Elizabeth Ciceri Ronai, uh, belonging to a, uh, to a much uh, uh, to, an, to another uh, to another uh, generation, um, and uh, and I, it is from my point of view the only name I can remember with uh, a comparable, not an eagle, but comparable uh, metaphorical disponibility as uh, Tatiana Grosso. Uh, Tatiana Grosso uh, has. Um, Tatiana uh, is uh, a member of one of the most prestigious Moldavian. Uh, literary works, literary workshops. It is called the Vladiovice Literary Workshop. It is led by the world renowned uh, novelist and the poet uh, Dumitru Krudu. Uh, and uh, each year he is creating, he is giving a lot of uh, uh, very young and very talented poets, uh, making from Moldavia, uh, a country with around uh, four millions of inhabitants, uh, one of the Poetical world powers of uh, uh, of uh, of the day. Um, Tatiana made her debut uh, with uh, with uh, a very uh, with a very strong uh, with a very strong uh, collection, uh, which impressed in a moment where everyone tries to uh, tries to impress uh, with. Uh, um, I don't want to say with violence. I don't want to say with uh, shocking, but everybody tries to impress uh, by uh, surprising some some something someone with something. Tatiana impresses with sensitivity. Tatiana impresses with original lyricism and with uh, uh, poetry that uh, uh, that uh, besides of being very original. Uh, reminds uh, in uh, uh, reminds the uh, Romanian poetry of the 20th century in its best, and also the Central European traditions 
of the uh, intellectual uh, of the intellectual uh, sensitivity uh, connected to uh, connected to uh, the uh, philosophical poetry and uh, contemporary physical uh, physical thinking. Tatiana, if I forgot something, please complete, please fulfill, please tell about yourself uh, as an author uh, what the critic will never be able to tell. Because let us remember what Karol Chapik used to say, uh, the critic is the one which is uh, which says to poets, that's what I would do, that's how I would do uh, if I would be able to. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Actually, I think that this one was a, was one of the most, uh, let's say, impressive uh, presentations and descriptions of myself, which I have ever had. Um, I think that, uh, OK, the, the most important things I can say about myself is that um, um, I had the chance to make my debut in 20, uh, 2021. Um, I haven't got uh, I haven't got such a great background, um, a literary background or so, uh, a writing one. I'm still a student and I still learn how to write, how to do this uh, um, these things in the best way. Um, I study, now I'm a student, I'm in the fourth year of my studies and I study foreign languages and, uh, and literature. Uh, one of them is English and uh, the second, my second language is, uh, is French. Uh, so um, I've started, I can tell you a bit about my, uh, let's say, first attempts in writing. Um, I, I think um, the first, the first poem I wrote uh, was when I was eight years old, I think. And um, I remember I was with my, um, I was having a good time with my family. And uh, uh, I told my mom that I'd like to, to read her poem. I read the poem, <laughs> but he didn't believe <laughs> I wrote it. <laughs> I had to demonstrate that I did it. <laughs> And so started my, my, my writing, let's say, uh, uh, path. Uh, well, I continued writing, um, so lo long time, um, but um, uh, after, so after um, uh, starting uh, attending this work, uh, um, this um, uh, writing, uh, creative writing uh, workshop, um, I, I I think I started doing it um, much more better. So um, uh, Mircha already told us about this uh, creative writing workshop led by Dimitro Podo, and uh, I'm really happy to be to be a member of it. And uh, thanks to this creative writing workshop. Um, I had the chance to, to know and to get acquainted with uh, many, many other um, authors from our country, from Moldova, from Romania, and even uh, from abroad. Uh, and that's great. Uh, that, that, that's really great. Poetry unites us. Um, well, um, I, I think that... Um, that, that's it, what is to be <laughs> said for now about me. Um, maybe before uh, kindly asking you to read something from your works. Um, you know, this is actually one of Rick's favorite questions, if not the very favorite. Um, what do you think about the moral uh, obligation of uh, the author is the writer uh, somehow uh, obliged to adopt some moral attitudes uh, during and through uh, his writing, or writing art plus for art, art for art, it's enough. What do you think? 
Uh, well, it's a good question. <laughs> I didn't actually expect it. <laughs> I think it depends on what you write. Because uh, if you um, if you if you want to write, let's say, moral tales or moral writing, it has to have a moral. But if you decide to do art and to to write, uh, let's say, poetry. It's, uh, it's not uh, compulsory for it to have moral. Um, and again, it depends which moral you mean. Because uh, if we speak about the, um, let's say the, the social context we are in, um, social and political context, uh, they, um, I, I think that literature has to cover these topics. But um, well, not 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 sure how to how to uh, formulate uh, in the best way my, my answer to, to this question. Well, let's take two examples. If uh, they are not opposed, they are complementary for sure. Uh, almost one year, uh, one of the literary magazines that uh, appear in Moldova at the time, Temple de Moldova, uh, dedicated its uh, uh, poetry columns uh, to one of the uh, most serious uh, threatens that uh, is happening now in Europe, uh, that means the war in Ukraine. And uh, this was a very strong moral attitude. This was a very strong rea moral reaction to what is happening in the immediate vicinity of, uh, uh, of uh, Moldova. There was also the plan of uh, uh, editing some uh, collection, some poetry collection with some poetry anthology with uh, authors uh that uh, would write exclusively about this item exclusively about this thematic so this would be an example of uh, this would be an example of a courageous moral uh moral thematic by the way last week the thematic of uh, the workshop uh, led by dimitri krudu was courage Mm -hmm. uh, courage while writing. What means being a courageous author? That means courage by aborting a certain, by addressing a certain thematic, courage by writing in a certain way, courage by stylistically addressing uh, things and uh, styles which uh, are not uh, used, which are not usual. Uh, usual for you. So, in short, in order to, to, to modestly try to fulfill your answer, uh, moral is being courageous. Moral is not being afraid of writing about uh, what you feel you should write and, uh, well, let's say someone else uh, that wouldn't like you, uh, wouldn't like you uh, to do it. What is courage for you, Tatiana? Uh, well, probably courage for me is to write what, what, what you said, to write, to write what I feel and not to, uh, not to blur my, my thoughts and what I want to, to say. Uh, and of course, courage is to, okay, to be courage enough is to write and develop upon social subjects, as you said, to write about the war, to write about what is happening, what is the reality, and not to be, uh, not to be afraid of that. Yes. Thank you very much. So this was the fulfilling, this was the uh, thing I would have liked you to fulfill, to complete. Uh, uh, to concerning the respective the respective question. Now, 
please, if you would like to read something from your works, what you prepared for today, we are all looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Well, I would like to just start with a recent poem, and then I will continue with some uh, with some others. Uh, so we are quaking like potatoes on the table, potatoes in the drawers, potatoes in the bed, potatoes. These potatoes made us strong. Only thanks to them, we can weigh with bare arms the sacks and we'll never mistake the figure. That's because we know how much a kilo of potatoes values. Our life is so strongly lied to the turfs that even we lost the immunity to Colorado bugs. And in our chest is beating an everlasting potato. It's new, fresh, and young, covered with an extra fine skin. We seeded our bodies to the roots. Potatoes make me get up in the mornings. For the sake of their leaves, I rub my fingertips to remain upright, to remain upstanding until we turn into potatoes, until we will grow up sometime. Thank you. Um, then I would like to continue with some other poems, uh, which are which are which were already published in the uh, uh, in my debut book. book. Uh, and the book opens with a poem called The Blue Dragonfly. A mirror sure than under my skin, on my left shoulder, my veins like the underground pipes, the siren a calling to you again, the memory about the kneeling and the writers once in front of the red cars, on unknown roads, with the whipping eyes, a pile of stones and ash on the back, over my head, a blue dragonfly. Thank you. Can I read one more? Yeah, all right. Um, I mean, we expect at least some or 10 more, okay. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, okay. We were staying face to face at the table, telling stories which happened to, to us before. And suddenly I felt detaching from something. I was breaking the, bre the bread crumbs as I was tearing a calendar sheet. I put the crumbs around the plate and began laughing insanely as if I have been feeling good, like an old cassette. Well, I have to stress that uh, Tatiana's poems are usually short and very concentrated. I mean, their metaphorical uh, charge is uh, very strong and uh, each word expresses a lot of things and you have to be to take care because the meaning of the respect, the metaphorical meaning of the respective word can belong to the respective place, to the sentence the word belongs to and to the phrase the sentence belongs to so it's not easy at all oh thank you Mircha. i think that's too much you make me shy <laughs> oh that's too much it is an accusation i will be sad no it isn't it wasn't well i will read one more then laying in the position on that bed like a piece of flesh where you and others had been eating from with the spread legs like a freshly caught herd from which blood flows till warm. I start when I see the door is opening and I put white bed sheets over me which absorb the and grow red spots until the last is clean. The door latch is pulled down and I promise myself to never do that again. This is a kind of classical 
again, it's, it reminds me the structure of a Greek classical poem um, ending somehow in a Homerian key. Uh, it, so, so it was about Homer here. Um, Laura mentioned uh, something, uh, something about it. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it actually it actually has such a uh, such an ending classical content that uh, I feel we need another one after it. Really, only one, please, so that it is it wouldn't it wouldn't end like in a Greek old drama. Wow. Oh. Let's read one more then. Uh, I'm yearning for you, like the child from the TV is yearning for his mother and father. I got older and my muscles became a rubber elastic, which you pull as hard as you can. Somewhere inside, I suppose it would happen. Bibi, from an American movie, did herself in. That, it seemed to me impossible to find yourself on the verge of a mental illness. My thoughts split into silly thoughts and thoughts of no importance. I've been writing so much about love. I'm yearning for, you, for the most beautiful days in our life and for Bibi. I've always been sympathizing with poor people. It was never hard to me to do that. Why is it so hard for you? I avoid the theory of thoughts materializations every day, sometimes, when I close my eyes, I see how pillows flies in me, then punches, and I start. I grab my head with my hands and press my temples. When I say the word yearn, I imagine a poor dog in front of my door, a lost dog, an abandoned dog, a dog with a lack of love. Bibi had a dog. On that morning, it put its head on her chest and began to howl. And um, well, I think that I will read two more poems and that, that would be enough, <laughs> what you say. Well. You're too modest, young lady, too modest indeed. You do fine work, very fine work. Thank you. When I say the bluish sky, I want to come closer, insistently, to see that you are not there. I'm going further, the siren burns, in my mind a thunder breaks my eardrums. No, that's not you and will never be in any of those, in any of those red cars which I follow, which follow me. Um, well, Thank you. May I ask That's a question? Powerful. Sorry, yeah, of course. I was wondering, um, do you have an interest in writing uh, prose, or a novel, short stories, as well as poetry? Or do you see yourself much more as a poet? Well, I did try to write some prose. But, uh, but uh, they weren't so many as poems. <laughs> so I did try, <laughs> but yeah. Let me ask you one more question. Uh, in uh, many poetry can, um, environments, uh, there's, there's the solitary poet uh, sharing their work with just a few people. And of course, we now have this Zoom phenomena as well as the live phenomena from time to time. Do you perform your work in pubs or uh, on in Zoom meetings, or are you still thinking of yourself more as a student and, and not quite ready for that part of things? No, I, I think I'm not quite ready. And that's because I'm not, uh, I'm not a very talkative person. I used to, to write in my corner and I would, be, I would rather read <laughs> and do some research then uh, then uh, read in front of so many people and perform yeah it's uh, it's different from what i feel <laughs> sure sure i was well, actually everyone... really... yeah sorry. When, um, sorry go ahead brother well rick um well i can tell 
is that uh, I will take care of this. <laughs> I mean, in the future, she will read. Um, I mean, I don't know whether in pubs, but for sure in literary clubs. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure because before of a very numerous audience, because her poetry really, uh, really deserves this. And uh, it will happen or it will happen as or as one of your dutiful alliterative poems used to repeat once after the same the after after uh, eight verses it will it will end of course uh, for Tatiana <laughs> to, to, to know uh, it is one of the most be uh, one of the most beautiful uh, Rick's poems uh, which ends uh, each after each uh, eight, eight verses, which is this alliteration, it will, it will. So mm -hmm. I try to apply in your case for the <laughs> development of your literary career. But you promised us our last poem. Yes. Uh, let me see which will be the last. Um, One, two, three. Let me see who wants coffee and who wants tea. <laughs> Uh, well, let's read this one. I wish something to happen so as not to go mad. As I were wishing when coming from school for the Christmas to come. When opening my eyes in front of the door, I was wanting to cry, for I couldn't help with anything my mother. As children, we all suffered with no guilt. Nobody loved me, and I was doing such stuff, then were begging them for love in my mind. Now I pray for something to happen, so as not to go mad. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Tatiana Grosu, Moldova, young and very talented Romanian writing poetess. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Tatiana, for participating in this uh, in this program. Thank you very much, Rick, for uh, welcoming her uh, here. And uh, if uh, I may allow myself, of course, Rick decides. I only suggest. I think the program would not be complete if Rick wouldn't read some of his wonderful poems at the end of the program himself. What well, do ladies very think? Kind. Very kind. Um, I, I will I will take a little a little uh, uh, space just for a second to say I have an answer for the question of how important poetry is. Uh, no one goes to poetry because of the money. No one goes to poetry because of the fame. But I tell you this, if poetry wasn't important, they wouldn't chant it at sports events. They wouldn't use it in the military. It wouldn't be in every popular song. Poetry is that hidden power, that amazing secret that we have, that we cultivate. And they want it, they need it, but they pretend that we're not important. And that's amusing to me. And my dear brother, my dear brother, Thank you for the invitation. I will take you up on it and read you one little fresh piece. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I nudge the muse every day and try, if only as an exercise, to write something every day. But let me bring you something very, very fresh. I'll take it right out of the phone where it's... Uh, <laughs> where they often land first. Let's let's see, here we go. I, I heard startling, incredibly awful news about the Arctic melting that they expect in just a few short years. There'll be no, there'll be no ice at all in the summertime in the North Pole. So this is called Save the Arctic. Save the Arctic, that's cool. Man has broken all the rules. The CO2 is shooting up. What's that you're drinking in that cup? Greenland seen the first historic rain, though where it's disappeared to, 
racks my brain. It's lost where permafrost once hit. No longer does it do what it used to did. F4, it was the glue that held where we walked and what we smelled. With permafrost gone, the water sinks. Where Arctic lakes went, the fever blinks. The missing links, the frost is gone, no longer glues the rocks and stones we used to use. For the foundations of where we walked, about that old climate change, uh, we should talk. It's not important that you don't have time, but boy, you got that right. We may very well be out of climb. My friends, thank you for being the poets that you are, you bright stars, you literary leaders. Thank you for joining us here at Poets of the East. I'm going to leave the last words to my brother, Mercia. I mean, you suggest I should use my gun, right? No, no. Okay. Uh, Trouble the world a little longer, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so all. I will know when it happens. Okay. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you very much, our kind guests, our talented poetesses, for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much, Rick Spisak, and his uh, untired energy dedicated to poetry because because everybody pretends it is not important, but actually it is the most important at all, being present everything, everywhere in the world and everywhere within objects animated or un unanimated of uh, this universe. And uh, dear guests, dear viewers, uh, dear hosts, dear producer, we wish you to have uh, to have always immense joy from poetry. We wish you to we wish you to understand the importance and the complexity of poetry every moment in every uh, in every piece of ex of your existence and this uh, universe. All the best with poets of the East, which are actually poets of the whole world. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.